pines and the hemlocks bearded with moss and in garments green, indistinct in the twilight, stand like druids of eld with voices sad and pathetic. Stand like carpers hoar with beards that rest on their bosoms. Loud from its rocky caverns, the deep-voiced neighboring ocean speaks, and in accents disconsolate answers the wail of the forest. This is the forest primeval, but where are the hearts that beneath it leap like the roe when he hears in the woodland the voice of the huntsman? Where is the thatch roofed village, the home of Acadian farmers, men whose lives glided on like rivers that water the woodland, darkened by shadows of earth, but reflecting an image of heaven? Waste are those pleasant farms, and the farmers forever departed. Scattered like dust and leaves when the mighty blasts of October seized them and whirled them aloft and sprinkled them far over the ocean. Not the tradition remains of the beautiful village of Grand Pre. So with these words, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow opened his epic poem, Evangeline, a tale of Acadie. Its unrhymed hexameters are a steep climb for many readers today, but there was a time when virtually every school child in America read this poem, and not a few of them committed it to memory. Evangeline was an instant success when it was published in 1847. It went on to appear in more than 270 editions and 130 languages over the next century. But the poem's beginnings were modest. It started at a dinner party in 1840. Longfellow's friend, the novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne, urged Reverend Hen uh, Horace Wal uh, Connolly rather, to relate a story he had heard of a French Acadian couple who had lived in the neighboring colony of Nova Scotia a century previous, during the last great war between the French and British empires in America. On the eve of their wedding, the couple were separated when British soldiers deported the colony's French inhabitants. She spent the rest of her life searching for her fiancé. Longfellow's Evangeline casts a long shadow in Atlantic Canadian historiography. A Victorian tale of feminine devotion and heroism, it was delivered in powerful language and set in an almost mythical landscape. Longfellow's Acadians dwelt in quaint, bucolic, rural isolation. And a quote, again, Neither locks had they to their doors, nor bars to their windows, but their dwellings were open as day and the hearts of the owners. There, the richest was poor, and the poorest lived in abundance. Later writers often chided Longfellow for his romanticism, but in doing so, they missed a significant point. Now, Longfellow, after all, was a romantic poet. He was not a historian, nor was he an archaeologist. And yet, by opening his poem in the forest primeval, I think he did touch something fundamental about the Akkadian story. With both disciplines in mind, I'd like to consider several questions now related to the people and to the land invoked in Longfellow's work. But before we can apply archaeology to his question, where is the thatch roof village, the home of Akkadian farmers, you might first ask, who are these Acadian farmers? And perhaps, why is their story significant to researchers like us? So let's begin with the who. The people known today as the Acadians are the descendants of the mostly French, mostly Catholic colonists who immigrated, mostly from southwestern France, to Canada's maritime provinces in the early 17th century. According to a French royal charter, in 1603, this entire region, in fact, stretching from the 40th to 46th parallels, was named Acadie, a name derived from Verrazano's early 16th century voyage to the middle latitudes of the American seaboard on behalf of Francis I. Astounded by the enormity and the beauty of the forests here, he named the land Arcadia. And over the next 80 years, the name migrated north on maps until at last becoming stuck in the Northeast on what historian John Bartlett Brebner once called North America's continental cornice. French officials in the 17th and 18th centuries called the colonists in this region Acadiens, 
to distinguish them from the Canadiens, the colonists of the St. Lawrence River Valley, places like Quebec and Montreal. Whereas the Canadiens survived the Seven Years' War and remained on their land to become the Francophone population of the province of Quebec, the Acadians, as Longfellow learned at his dinner party, were made refugees by this conflict. Although many eventually returned, the Acadians are today a widely scattered people. The refugees who eventually settled in Louisiana, for instance, would become known as the Cajuns. The historiography of the Acadian experience emphasizes two aspects of their story, but I really think it should emphasize three, and so that's what I'll do. I'll begin with the aspect that is most prominent and that is already apparent even here, the deportation of the Acadians by British and American troops beginning in 1755 and continuing until the close of the Seven Years' War. American historic historian John Mac Farragher has called this, not without controversy, quote, the first episode of state-sponsored ethnic cleansing in North America. How did this happen? The beginning of an answer is rooted in geography, for Acadie was established on a political fault line, separating the British and French empires in northeastern North America. Conflict between these European powers, which was not infrequent in the 17th and 18th centuries, resulted in border raids and incursions of all kinds in Acadia. And in fact, the capital, Port Royal, changed hands a remarkable eight times before a combined Anglo-American force finally captured it in 1710. The Treaty of Utrecht ceded the colony, indecisively named Acadie or Nova Scotia, to the British Crown in 1713, bringing with it a small population of French and indigenous inhabitants. Over the ensuing two decades, colonial leaders established a delicate legal framework, enabling the region to be peacefully, though imperfectly, incorporated into the British Empire. After much resistance, the Acadians swore a qualified oath of allegiance to King George II in the late 1720s. Knowing too well the political instability that plagued the colony, and fearing the consequences of being pressed into military service against their French and indigenous neighbors, the Acadians committed to only a limited oath, maintaining their right to remain neutral in the event of war. Meanwhile, the indigenous people of the Wabanaki Confederacy in Nova Scotia, principally the Mi'kmaq people, negotiated a treaty of peace and friendship with the Crown. It surrendered no territory, guaranteed traditional Mi'kmaq access to land and the fishery, and permitted limited British settlement. Now these developments align well with historian Richard White's model of negotiated colonialism, profiled in his book, The Middle Ground, the title of which was used by archeologist Chris Gosden in his tripartite model of colonialism. And so things may have continued in Acadie or Nova Scotia had the Seven Years' War not intervened in 1755. In that year, Britain's colonial government decided to preemptively deport the French inhabitants, people who they saw as a security threat. So, this momentous decision, together with its causes and consequences, has been one focus of traditional historiography. It has been enshrined in the authorized heritage discourse and memorialized with historic sites in Canada and the United States. It's been materialized through art, some of which you're looking at right now. And it has been uh, also memorialized in national historic sites uh, like this one here with the statue of Evangeline herself uh, from 1919, Grand Prix National Historic Site, now the centerpiece of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So if politics then is the first major theme of the Acadian, of Acadian historiography, the land is the second. And this is because the Acadians practiced a form of agriculture that significantly changed the face of the landscape, tidal marsh reclamation. And though they were not the only European colonists to do this in America, as, as some have claimed, the degree to which they focused their efforts on the marshes was, ra was rare, in fact, if not unique. Moreover, the environment they farmed, the Bay of Fundy and its estuaries, tested all of their technology and all of their strength and all of their wit, because the tidal range here is the highest in the world, um, 16 meter tides, 50 foot tides. It strikes me that the Acadian case offers a useful illustration of the impact even a small group of people can bring to a landscape. Consider Exhibit A, the Grand Prix Marsh. 
3,000 acres of tidal wetlands enclosed by the piecemeal efforts of tin-based laborers between roughly 1680 and 1755. At no time did their population number more than a few hundred men, women, and children. Acadian dikeland agriculture has not only been a focus of scholarship in its own right, the technology, its adaptation and transfer, but many writers identify the routines of draining and damming marshes as the force motivating Acadian ethnogenesis. And this community exists today as a distinct national group. The political economist James Laxer says, quote, the Abwateau, it's a sort of drain system, you were looking at one a moment ago, was a unique technological adaptation, took on a kind of personality, and certainly helped shape the, the uh, nature of Acadian communities. Farragher, more pointedly, says, quote, the communal work on the dikes was perhaps the most important factor in the development of a common sense of Acadian identity. Because of these arguments, or perhaps because of the enduring and indeed monumental nature of the Acadians' dikeland legacy, while the rest of their world had been basically swept away by war, dikeland infrastructure has become a focus of heritage value. It's interesting to see rural vernacular architecture or technology elevated in this way. For example, when our team excavated a well-preserved 17th century abwateau in 2006, it was not long before it was granted a place in the permanent exhibit at Grand Prix National Historic Site. And here I should pause briefly to acknowledge the support of Parks Canada, the local landowners, and the donors who made this work possible. Now that said, there is still something very important missing from this picture of colonial Acadia. It is also absent from commemorative art and, uh, not surprisingly, from Longfellow's pages. This third and grossly understudied aspect of the Acadian story is, for me, one of the most fascinating. It is that the Acadian experience unfolded in an indigenous world, a world inhabited, understood, and ordered by people whose cultures had developed independently of Eurasian cultures for over 10,000 years. Surprisingly, the terraforming Acadians, by and large, enjoyed a peaceful coexistence with their indigenous neighbors, the hunting and gathering and fishing Mi'kmaq. This sustained peaceful relationship, and particularly with the Mi'kmaq, is virtually unique in the context of indigenous settler relations in early colonial America. It is both worthy of note and worthy of much further study. Two quick illustrations will give you a sense of the colonial society that Longfellow did not see. The first, two 18th century maps contrasting Acadian vernacular settlements, there's one village at least, one hamlet on the Annapolis River, with the planned town of Halifax, founded by Britain as a new capital and naval base in 1749. You will observe on these maps and on dozens of other maps like them, that the planned town as an instrument of formal empire was walled. Acadian settlements, though they are much smaller, more scattered, certainly more isolated and, and susceptible to attack, never were defended. The second is an entry from a parish register in the church of Saint Jean Baptiste in Port Royal, made in 1703. It names the participants in an Acadian marriage ceremony, perhaps a luckier pair than Evangeline and her fiance. Jean Clemenceau and Anne Roy, Anne's parents are identified as Jean Roy, natif de Saint Malo, a Marie Sauvagesse de l'Acadie. But if you read further, you can find many examples of intermarriage like this one. If you look harder yet, you'll find other cases where indigenous identities are ignored or even removed from the records. Nevertheless, these bonds were real and enduring. They had material as well as emotional dimensions. So, having positioned Acadian experience in time and space, and having outlined three of its prominent features, the deportation, diking, and its relationship with First Nations, you might now ask where archaeology comes in. And I think archaeology has two contributions to make. The first is that muddy boot style of archaeology, field archaeology, that so many of us relish. This is the evidence gathering kind of archaeology that opens new windows on the past, and it's very badly needed here. The deportations not only removed the French inhabitants, but devastated their lands and the productive environments they created. Here, from the orderly book of 
Lieutenant Colonel John Winslow of Massachusetts, the man who operated the deportation from Grand Pre in 1755, is a partial record of that destruction. And uh, it should be mentioned that this is only one corner of one small part of the colony. The Acadians were not in general illiterate people, and their reputation suffered at the hands of the elites who wrote about them. Archaeology offers a powerful corrective lens in these cases. That's why, for the past 16 years, I've been running an annual archaeological field school at Grand Prairie National Historic Site with Parks Canada. We've been pushing the limits on what we can learn about our colonial history, uh, really expanding our knowledge base. So few of these sites have been recorded. It's really remarkable. Um, we've also been experimenting with new technologies, uh, aerial photography survey, photogrammetry with digital platforms, geophysics as well, using um, electromagnetic induction surveys to detect what are very often very, very ephemeral sites. The Acadians built mostly with wood. But the deeper and more important questions, questions of why, questions of meaning and of identity, these call for another kind of archaeology, don't they? A more theoretically informed interpretive archaeology, and above all, one that recognizes materiality as a mediator, if not a silent actor in our histories. And it is in this sense, I think, that Longfellow actually stumbled onto something crucial when he opened his poem in the forest primeval, a liminal place inhabited by animistic forces. Longfellow's predecessors also identified the Acadians with the forest, but the connection was not at all romantic. Because Acadian agriculture focused on the marshlands, the uplands were not extensively cleared and stumped in most agricultural settlements. And beyond the Acadian hamlets, forests dominated the landscape. John Spittle, a Scottish soldier who served in the province in 1750, wrote with dismay that even from the hilltops his gaze could not reach 100 paces, for, quote, the country was all the way it seemed to keep its original face. In short, I saw nothing but large trees and some few rocks. Robert Hale, a merchant from Beverly, Massachusetts, was unimpressed by Acadia when he visited in 1731. Quote, the land is all full of low shrubby trees and looks as though not one had ever been cut down here since the creation. The forest, it seemed, had resisted civilization. These readings in turn fed a discourse that labeled the French inhabitants as a primitive other. Despite their successes with the dike lens, for instance, even Paul, Paul Mascarene, who was a Huguenot, uh, thought the Acadians were, quote, for the generality, very little industrious. Massachusetts-born Charles Morris, later one of the architects, architects of the deportation, felt they were but indifferent husbandmen. And John Spittle, again, thought the inhabitants, once he emerged from the forest on their farms, were generally indolent. Observers regularly derided their houses as crude mud huts. Moses de la Vergne, who lived among the Acadians before the deportation, remembered that they wholly neglected improving the upland, this is a quote, and left all their manure in heaps about their barns during a century and more. Now never mind that the fertile dike lands didn't require manuring. What visitors saw was an absence of economy, order, above all improvement, that almost disqualified them from the status of European colonists. And these dim assessments darken further when contrasted with the cult of commerce and progress that historians have shown really typified early uh, 18th century discourses of British national identity. Another major component of that identity, Protestantism, Protestantism uh, likewise alienated the Catholic Acadians from the British Empire, especially after the Second Jacobite Rebellion. But historians have already traced these connections. What I think archaeology can add here is a greater sensitivity to the role played by landscape and materiality in preparing ground mentally for the deportations. The literature on ethnic violence emphasizes that physical violence in societal scales has precursors. First come discourses of self and other, in which the groups are identified and essentialized, primitive, indolent, then demonized as a threat. Catholic, yes. But there was something else in this case, and it was even worse, especially for the New Englanders. The Acadians were expert woodsmen. Commonly, they wore moccasins. They fished from brush weirs of indigenous design. They traveled dexterously by birch bark canoe. One observer noted that the Acadian women in particular were, quote, very bold on the water. 
Deerville, who spent a year in Port Royal, judged the inhabitants idle during the greatest part of the year and very much given to hunting in their spare time. Regarding their appearance, Charles Morris said they, quote, delight much in wearing long hair and are of dark complexion in general and somewhat of the mixture of the Indians. Mid-century, Governor Cornwallis reported his concerns about the Acadians to the Board of Trade. Quote, some of them will probably take arms as they can easily disguise, them, disguise themselves. Many of them are of Indian blood and not unlike them. In other words, and returning to the points I mentioned earlier, the Acadians' most fundamental adaptations in the colonial world, diking, peaceful coexistence, were the very things that furnished Anglo-Americans with the symbols necessary to imagine them as primitive and threatening. In conclusion, the Acadian deportations Pardon me. In conclusion, the Acadian deportations mark a disjunction in the colonial history of Atlantic Canada. Over a century of development marked by pluralism, negotiation, and hybridity, the middle ground was violently hauled away. The doctrine replacing it saw the indigenous peoples and the French colonists as hostile others whose indolence and inability to improve the land forfeited their title to it. This, as Chris Gosson has written, is the doctrine of terra nullius derived from the ancient Roman theory of property that regarded unoccupied land, which is to say land not in agricultural production, as empty and free for the taking. This doctrine underwrote the expropriation of indigenous lands throughout the early modern period, and it is a reminder that concepts of rurality can be closely linked to ideas about power, order, and legitimacy. This doctrine relied, and perhaps still relies, on a particular way of reading the rural landscape and have established the deportations as an idea long before that idea could become actionable. <laughs> Perhaps then, in Longfellow's Forest Primeval, we can hear not only the deep-voiced neighboring ocean, but a whisper of empire. Thank you.